Do you love to cook and dream about someday taking a class from a master chef? Me too. Well, today I'm certainly dressed for the part and I'm off to cooking school. Come on, join me on this delicious adventure. a long line of homemakers and great cooks but somewhere in the gene pool well I got more of the decorating gene and less of the cooking gene fortunately for me Johnson & Wales one of the best cooking schools in the world is right here in my hometown come on let's learn how to cook together Johnson & Wales opened its Charlotte campus in 2004 located in the revitalized uptown business district of the Queen City this is their fastest growing campus with over 2500 students the campus features brand new state-of-the-art business and culinary facilities including street front baking and pastry lab I'm so glad you decided to join me today now we have three classes scheduled our first one is bread making or vino serie as we say in France our instructor is Chef Harry Paymuller, and he's got some great lectures going. We're going to be late if we don't hurry up. All right, guys, uh, welcome back. Day one for Vinocerie. Basically, this class will kind of bridge the gap between the bread class that we took and the other pastry classes that you're going to be able to take. Okay? So bread, we took uh, flour and water, we mixed it, added a little yeast to it, salt, you know, but that's basically it. Now we're adding more eggs, we're adding more butter to it. Our leavener is still yeast. So it's a little hard to work because we know the yeast gets too warm, what's gonna happen? It will run rapidly, you know, it will multiply like crazy. You're gonna have the strong, undesirable yeast flavor. We don't want that, we wanna control the yeast, okay? So I need uh, the chef of the day, just come over here real quick. I'm gonna have my scale over here and I have my dough that I took out from the refrigerator. I'm gonna dust a little bit of flour and uh, I'm gonna put this upside down. This dough right now appears to be firm, but it's not because we added a lot of flour. It is because the butter that we have inside is really solidified. Okay, so we can take this one off. Uh, when you're gonna scale, I try to always go from one side to another. That's a little bit of flour on the table. We're using bread flour or all-purpose flour because it floats better. When we use cake flour, pastry flour, it starts to lump, not very good. So one and a half ounces. So we're gonna take like little chunks out over here. And right now this dough looks really, really small and compact because the yeast is sleepy. We put this dough in the refrigerator and uh, what's gonna happen is the yeast hasn't really worked at this point. It's really sleepy. Once this dough starts to proof up, the yeast will digest the, the broken down sugars into alcohol and CO2. Then it's like rounding up bubble wrap almost, okay? So basically, I already have divided a few of these products. They're all one and a half ounce. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna round them up now, okay? So we're gonna take this one and just chill it a little bit more because this will take a little time and uh, you can practice that a little bit again. Cool, put it back in the bowl. And students, let's do it. So now we're gonna do is we are taking a little bit of flour on the hand over here. And I'm gonna take a little piece of this mixture and maybe the size of a quarter. Round it up, flatten it out, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it right there on top and use our hands. Now, we're gonna cut this little bit in flour and we're gonna give them a one quick dab. All right, you wanna do this here real quick, guys? Let's do it. Okay, maybe not. Now stick into my hand. This is my right. cooking partner here. Smell this. Smells like beets. Smells like beets. I like beets. I love like you know? beets. So now it's not only a, a color that you're gonna add, it's also something, you know, surprising that maybe somebody doesn't expect, yeah. you know. So uh -huh. for a certain dish, you know, sometimes for a certain restaurant I tell my students, you like know. Like a Greek salad. A Greek salad, perfect. You know, we have this one. Okay, and so I, is that flat enough and cover it up? Wow, perfect, yes. Okay, and you don't push Absolutely. down real hard, right? No, just one quick. Close the eyes and just, okay, that was really gentle over there. I'm having a great time. Beautiful. Look at that. How pretty is that? Uh, and how long would it take for these to bake? I would say 12 minutes, but the proofing is an hour, hour and a half. I would do them the evening before, 
let them prove for 30 minutes, uh -huh. okay? Then you put it in plastic in the refrigerator. You get up, put the coffee pot on, turn the oven on, in 20 minutes you have fresh baked products over there. Perfect. Students get busy mixing, measuring, and preparing for their next steps. The mixers are whirling and I can't wait to get my hands coated in flour and dough. The chef made up this dough yesterday so it would be ready for his class today. The cool thing about it is this can stay in the refrigerator for a couple of days. So if you're having a party, you can make it up ahead of time. Another really neat feature about this kind of dough is that he's going to show us how to make multiple kinds of pastries out of just one recipe. Now, the other table has got some students that are putting together, weighing out the flour and all the butter so he can make dough from scratch. So we'll learn how he's doing that. What we're going to do is now I have divided one and a half ounce. You add a little bit of flour. When you add too much flour, when you have a lot of flour on the table, and you're going to work that. If you be able to do this, it costs you money. You don't want to do this. Next thing, just a little bit, take your hands, you know, make a little mold. Take your hands and make the crawl. Put it over there. And right now, what I'm gonna do is now I'm gonna roll it. Okay. <laughs> Nothing has happened because it's not how often, how long you're gonna roll. You need to put pressure on it. Once you put pressure, I'm doing the same thing that I did before, but now it's round. Cool, you wanna do this, guys? Yeah. Let's do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay, that one's not working. And when it sticks, just put a little flour underneath it. Okay, a lot of stick, a lot of stick. <sighs> Need some flour. What, I gotta just throw it. There you go. Yeah, that's, that looks good. I like that. Is. We're in the kitchen, we need to put a little flour on it. Perfect, Vicky, looks awesome. It looks awesome. Is that roll laughing at me? It looks better than mine, no. <sighs> Can't have awesome. my rolls laughing at me. Guys, how, how, how are we looking here? It's like, are you feeling over here too much pressure? It will melt, right? The butter will melt. Mm -hmm. We want it to melt later on, we eat it, not right now. When it sticks on the table, guys, I have a scraper, you know, just get this off of it. It's like Velcro, you know? Once, once you have this dough on the table, it will always stick. I'm liking these rolls. Look at those things. Can you believe I just roll them up like that with my hand? Horrible. I got the claw down. How are we gonna... That's my best one. Very good. That was pretty darn good. This is now, you could use these rolls over there. Egg wash them, put them in a proof box, bake them. Now we have already one product ready, one product ready. What we're going to do is now we're going to make the traditional brioche uh, shape. Those we just rolled. So what you have to do is the dough is now tightened up a little bit. That protein from the flour kind of tighten it up. Let that sit for maybe five minutes and then we're going to take these and shape them. I already have some rolled up over there. Lisa, can you get that sheet pan? So now we're going to do is again we have a little bit of flour because this dough has now relaxed. When you say relaxed, what do you mean? Well, the thing is, there's protein in bread flour uh -huh. and wheat flour. So when we agitate it, it gets really, really to the point where if you would roll it out, it would contract. That protein is really, really tough. And that protein, when you let it set, it will relax and you can roll it out a little bit longer. Now we're going to take and we're going to roll it. And we are not 100% detaching it, okay? I'm going to roll it a little bit until the point where it's almost detached. We're just going to squeeze it right there in the middle. And the thing is, the warmth of your hand will now melt the butter. So now we're going to take this and we're going to flip this point all the way through. So now we have the button right there in the middle and that's the traditional brioche shape. So now we're going to put this one right away in the middle, try to keep it as straight as possible so it can prove that. We've had a lot of fun here in the bread breaking class today, and of course our chef, who's done such a fantastic job, Harry Paymiller, has been putting us through the paces about how to work with bread, create all these great things. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to find out a little bit more about him. So how did you end up here at Johnson Wells? How did your career in food start? Well, I started uh, in the tender at the tender age of 14 in Germany, in Hamburg, at, uh, with an apprenticeship program, uh -huh. three years, and worked a little bit in Europe and uh, I wanted to have another chance, so I wanted to go for one year to the United States. And in 89, I came to a town I never heard of, Orlando, Florida. Then from there, I went to Miami. I applied for Johnson & Wales in Miami, but they needed somebody in Norfolk, Virginia. What is the thing that you like the most about working with food? To work with food is something very 
basic. You only have a few items that you're gonna use, especially, you know, I'm working more with flour and the bread maker. Mm -hmm. So do you feel it's just as important to teach your students the romance and the meaning of food, just as important as the recipes and how to handle them? Yes, there's much more to just making a bread. You know, I'm telling them, Making a baguette in this class is more a metaphor because there's a living organism inside. There is not a baking powder inside that you can stop. It's almost like turning on a nuclear reactor. Once you turn it on, you cannot just go turn it off for, for going to a break. It will work. There's items to, to observe. You need to bake it. There is so that uh, energy and the that energy. attention to that is so important. You have to so cool important. it the right way. You better come up with a game plan, otherwise that little simple ingredients will, will run your life. Brett, never tried it before. Today was a great class. I loved Thank it. You. And I can't wait to see how everything comes out of that oven. I'm sure it will be good seeing you at work over there. It's uh, <laughs> really, really great. Thank you, Chef. Thank you very much. Our first batch turned out perfect. We continued to work to create a basket full of beautiful bread. Man does not live by bread alone. My next class is meat cutting, where I'll learn how to cut up a whole chicken. Now everybody knows it's cheaper to buy a whole chicken and then cut it up, but when I try to do that at my house, it hasn't been a pretty sight. In fact, my family likes to call it mystery meat. Well, my next class is the principles of meat cutting and my instructor is Chef James O'Hara. He's gonna show me how it's done. Come on in, we're already started. Today, uh, today uh, we are gonna be working uh, with what we call broilers or fryers. And those are in the category between two to four pounds. Okay, uh, when you look at the classifications of chicken, uh, the very smallest chicken, uh, less than a pound, is a poussin. Uh, then from a pound to two pounds is a Cornish hen. Uh, and then we're dealing with what we call broiler fryers, which are between two to four. Above that, we call them uh, roasters, which are, uh, it's a larger bird uh, and best for a, a roasting technique. All right, so the first thing uh, that we want to do is get familiar with the chicken. The front of the animal, uh, which we know as the breast, is the chest area of the animal. Uh, and so that's right here. And then these are actually the legs of the animal. And uh, this is known as a drum, not a leg. Okay, most people call this a leg. This is the drum. The leg is a combination of the thigh and the drum together. Okay, so that's the drum. This is the whole leg, and the thigh is here. Uh, up here are the wings. And so first we have what's called the drumette, okay, and that's a single bone uh, section. And then the wingette is a double bone section. Uh, and then here would be the uh, wing tip. Chickens store fat in three areas. Uh, anyone know what those three areas might be? No. Skin is one, generally in the skin. Anyone else? The breast is very lean, uh, but it is in the skin. Uh, the second is the abdominal cavity. So you can see here, this fat section is here, it's where birds store their fat. And also what we call uh, the fat pad, uh, or the tail section. Uh, and its nickname is uh, Pope's hat. If you see, it looks like a Pope's hat. You ready? I'm ready to try this. Okay. So, uh, you guys, go ahead. Uh, everyone, go ahead and grab a chicken. Pretty bird. Pretty bird. Hello, viewers. Take your knife in. Uh-huh. On a 90, nice and flat, and then okay. turn it to a 45. Okay. And go straight to the table. There you go. Now I gotta find my wishbone. You can feel it. It's right here, in there. Yeah. What you want to do is put your knife right up into the wishbone like this. Yep. And if you ever ridden a motorcycle or a moped, yep, yep. it's kind of a revving okay. technique, and just scrape the bone. All right. For the rest of you, uh, first step: really uh, remove part bone. of that neck if you need to. Knife in on a flat 90, and then down into a 45. Okay, and, and pop part of that neck off. If you got any excess fat on the neck, remove the fat from the neck, the skin. I said, you're putting quite a bit of pressure. When I can hear I'll tell you, it, then I've got it, right? This is not an easy task. No. These guys take two days working on this technique. Got a one whole wishbone right there. Now All also remember, when you're, when you're taking out the wishbone, you want to be semi-gentle because you're dealing with the most expensive part of the bird. You're up in the breast section. Not bad, not bad. Oh, you got too a, much you got a little oh, bit of meat on there, there, but that's okay. Okay, so he's all Good clean Good for the first time. All right, so now I'm going off to the wings, right? Yes. Okay, now I'm gonna do a round cut and then slide the meat so back. So you wanna put the bird on its side. Right here, okay. If you're ready to French, bird on its side, hold the wing tip up, extend the arm, take your knife, halfway down the drumette, ring cut all the way around, 
the drumette, pull the meat, skin, cartilage, connect the tissue, all down to the elbow joint, and then pop it the opposite way it bends. There you go, look at that. Yeah. All right, that was perfect. There you go. I gotta be a little alarm here. For the legs, you wanna remove the excess fat from the abdominal cavity, and you wanna cut off the fat pad. Is that excess or is that good? You could go a little tighter, that's okay. And we're gonna take the legs off, so you wanna make slits in the skin close to the, uh, to the drum in a 45 degree angle. Feel for the keel bone, and then make a slit right on the keel bone, so it kind of opens up for you. So that's it right there, right? That's my keel bone, yep. it kind of moves around a little bit, yep. like a little fat's on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna go to which side? Uh, I just slit the skin so I can see the keel bone a little okay. bit better, and then you can either go to the right side or the left side, depending on which breast you want to take off first. I've had great fun learning how to cut up a chicken today with Chef James O'Hara. What brought you to Johnson & Wales? What's your background? Uh, actually, uh, my bachelor's degree was in uh, communications uh, from Kent State University, but uh, I had worked in restaurants uh, all through high school, all through college, to put myself through school. Uh, when I graduated, I worked in the private sector, uh, working on private yachts, uh, cruising the Caribbean and Europe, and then after cooking professionally for about uh, 12 years, and decided that the best thing for me and the students was to go out in the industry and get some experience to bring back to the classroom. So, so what is it that you like the most about teaching your students? I love just uh, seeing the uh, students grow. I'm sure sometimes you go to a restaurant and there's one of your students that's working in that restaurant, especially in Charlotte. We've got such great places to eat because of Johnson & Wells being here. Many, many times uh, I try to actually go to the places that do support our school, uh, do support our students, and are willing to hire students and give them a chance to work in the industry. That's great. Well, thank you so much for my cooking oh, class my today. I just really enjoyed it. I feel really do. You know, I feel so much more confident to buy that whole chicken and go home and cut it off. Excellent. Right? Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Sure Appreciate it. Meat cutting is a job that requires lots of practice, but don't put away those knives yet. Coming up next is chopping and caring for veggies. Okay, now I've learned how to make bread and I've learned how to cut up a chicken. Now we can't forget our vegetables. I'm really fortunate today because I have Chef Mark Allison here with me and he is the Dean of Culinary Education here at Johnson & Wales. And you're gonna give me a private lesson on how to cut up vegetables and fruit, huh? That's what we're gonna do, Vicki, one-on-one. -on -one. Well, you know, I didn't know if it was like you were just being nice and giving me a private lesson or the fact that I have this big a knife, none of the other students wanted to be around me. Right? I didn't want to have, I didn't want to take that risk of having <laughs> anybody else in the classroom apart from the cameraman and uh, you with that uh, size knife. Hey, that's a wise choice, really. So how do we get started? Well, first of all, we've set everything up. Uh -huh. We've got a chopping board and underneath the chopping board, we've put something like a slip mat to stop the board from moving around. You've just got a wet towel. I've got a slip mat, it works exactly the same way you okay. could use some paper towel. Then make sure you've got your whole area clean. Then decide on the vegetables that you're going to chop up. Okay. And then, just so we're not moving around to the sink, I thought I'd have two buckets of water so we could just wash the vegetables okay. and then prepare them. So if you hand me a carrot, All right. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, give me one of them ones that is still unpeeled. What we can do is basically you want to put it in this water first. You because do. anything that's going on your chopping board wants to be relatively clean before you start okay. using it. So you've got your carrot, it's been dipped in water, then take your peeler and just take off slices of the skin. Okay. And you really want to use a peeler because you don't want to take too much of the flesh away from the carrot. And also all the nutrients are un just under the skin. Okay. So you don't want to take too much off. You've got that peeling, you just take a bowl, drop that in. Even the peeling. Here at Johnson & Wales, we do not throw out. We've got a composting program with the students that all our peelings get used to turn into compost. We will just use our chef's knife, which is a larger type knife, mm -hmm. pretty heavy, and then you want to cut the carrot into a size portion that fits your hand. Okay. Okay? Okay. So, one of the first cuts we can try is your carrot. Thank you. And you want to hold your knife, and you've probably held a knife before, but you want to grasp it so you've got a nice, firm hold of a knife. Okay. And just one or two pointers with the knife is, obviously you want to keep it as sharp as possible. Uh-huh. Needs to be clean. Never leave more than one knife on your chopping board, because otherwise you might have an accident. And if you leave the handle over, 
uh -huh. the board, make sure you push it back because if somebody comes along and they knock that knife, then it could end up in the foot or oh, it could wow. end up causing an accident. Then what you should never do with a knife is try and catch it when it's falling. Yeah, also, let it just hit the ground. That's it, just let it hit the ground. Doesn't matter how expensive the knife is, you can easily replace it. Okay. Then if you're cleaning the knife, never ever leave it in the sink. Put okay. it in the sink, wash it, dry it, put it away. And never the dishwasher. Never the dishwasher because the chemicals in the soap will have a reaction to the knife and it will start deteriorating the knife. The handle will start coming off, it'll start to stain the Okay, knife. great. So sure. wash it in the sink. So okay. now that we've got an even sized portion that we can hold, if you want to slice through the carrot, then basically you want to grip the carrot so that you're not going to cut your fingers okay. with the knife. So your tips are under, it's like a claw grip. Okay. And then with your knife, put the point on the board and then just slide the knife through as if you're rocking the knife backwards and forwards. And then just... Do you move the carrot or the move knife? Move the carrot and your knife sticks to your finger. Then you should have all round cuts. Okay. Get out of there, get out of there. Which is perfect. Okay. Excellent job. Okay. So that's one cut. Take our onion, and we've already peeled it, uh -huh. and you can usually use a paring knife just to peel off the skin. Okay. Then, what I suggest you do is you put the onion so the root is facing up to you. Okay. And then, take your knife and cut through the root. Okay. All the way down. That way, you're not cutting it, you're cutting it evenly in half, uh -huh. but you're not cutting it on one side that when you try to slice it, uh -huh. all the layers of onion are going to fall off. Exactly. So, you've got it in half. All right. Now, to t turn it into slices, then keep the, the uh, root away from you. Okay. And then, just slice through. And we're rocking again? We can rock when we get basically smaller the size onion, the easier it is to rock. Well, are you crying? Nope. And you know why? Why? Because you've got a very sharp knife. That's the secret. Huh? That's the secret. We've got Willie. Now, I already washed these. Okay. But to wash them, basically what you're going to do is cut down the stem. Uh-huh. And then you're basically going to take each leaf and you're going to run it under cold water. Because they have a lot of sand in there. They've got a lot yeah. of sand, they've got a lot of soil, a lot of dirt. Mm -hmm. So you really want to take that out. So now we've got it at that stage, okay. what we can do is just cut it through so it's in half. Okay. And we'll move it to one side. Okay. And then, you know, you've got this white area, which is like the onion part. Mm -hmm. And then also you've got the green area that you're also going to use. Okay. okay. You can use this green area, the top area, in something like a stock or a, a salad. You don't want to throw it away. Okay. okay, so you've got it on the bench, you've cut it in half, and now it's nice and flat. Then all you're gonna do with your knife again is take this rock in motion. Now, to keep the edge on the knife, then you basically want one of these, which is a steel. And then basically all you're gonna do, you have two methods. One that we show the students to begin with is just keeping the steel on the chopping board. Okay. And then just take your knife at an angle, around about 20 degrees. And you only want to do that four or five times. And do you do that every time before you use it? I would do it every time before I use it. Okay. Then you can hold the steel like this and keep your thumb underneath this handle because you don't okay. want to cut it. And then all you want to do again is an angle just either side. Well, Chef, this has been great. I really appreciate it. It's had a fun, fun day here. Excellent. Let's talk a little bit about Johnson & Wales and how you ended up being here. I originally got invited to work for Johnson & Wales. I was a senior instructor in uh, Neathport Talbot College in Wales, South Wales in the UK. Uh -huh. And my students in 2001 and 2002 won the biggest student competition in Europe called the Nestle Talk Door. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. And one of the judges was uh, Dean Gugamos, who was the university culinary dean. He spotted me and my winning team and offered me a position at Johnson & Wales. Well, what do you like about being in the um, role of a teacher versus working in maybe a high-priced restaurant, running around, doing that kind of a job? Um, I love teaching because it's a way of giving back. Uh, I did 14 years in industry, ended up being an executive chef of two fine dining restaurants. And then I got to the stage where really I wanted to give something back, but also wanted to settle down. Well, you have a lot of stuff to make stock out of here. Yeah. And I think I got a chicken up on the other floor that I left that uh, we'll bring it down, throw it in a crock pot. And yeah. I think we can have a whole meal here. We can have lunch. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Thank you. Well, I don't think I'm quite ready to host my own cooking show, but I certainly had a great time today. I want to thank my instructor, Chef Pei Mueller, for those great tips on bread making, and of course, Chef O'Hara for his great meat cutting skills. I think I did pretty good with that chicken. And Dean Allison for those tips on how to cut and handle vegetables. I hope you learned some tricks that you can use in your own kitchen. Now, join me again when we will have a lot more fun together creating great things around your home, your garden, and your kitchen that make you and your family have a better time at your house. I'm Vicki Payne, and thanks for stopping by. If you would like additional information about today's guests or project ideas, please visit us on the web at foryourhome.com. We will do our best to help you out.